Many of the items swept inland by the tsunami have been removed, but a number of people have been pushing to preserve some reminders of this unprecedented disaster. It's a different story in Fukushima, though. The aftermath of the nuclear accident means people there can only collect small items, and even that is hard. NHK World's Jun Yotsumoto has the story. A road sign mangled by the power of the sea. A poster for a festival that never took place. A clock frozen in time, marking the moment the earthquake struck. All of these items come from evacuated towns around Fukushima Daiichi. For nearly a year, Mitsuru Takahashi and his small team have been trying to preserve reminders of Japan's 2011 disaster. They've collected more than 100 items from the evacuation zone. It reads Tsunobochi, the name of the village the tsunami destroyed. This sake decanter is the first object Takahashi brought back. Finding it helped him understand his team's mission. The idea came to me that this could be the only physical evidence that shows people did indeed live here. We followed Takahashi and his team when they visited the restricted area in December. They went to a community hall that was used as an evacuation shelter shortly after the disaster. You really see the whole picture here, how quickly people had to leave without having time to clean up. The residents were fleeing the radiation from Fukushima Daiichi. The invisible threat is still a concern. Oh, Takahashi and his team need to check the level of radiation for each item. Only the ones that meet safety standards can be taken back to the museum. These newspapers from Fukushima are okay. They carried details of the disaster and were supposed to go out to readers on March 12th. But they sat abandoned in Fujio Hayashi's shop for three and a half years before he gave them to Takahashi. Even our memories of the disaster are fading away gradually. So I was always thinking that records of what happened must be passed down to future generations. Last month, Takahashi's team put about 40 of the objects they collected on display. And even though the items are inanimate, visitors can feel their stories. I used to walk and jog in this neighborhood. It might sound like an exaggeration, but a dream about this place. So in that sense, I'm thankful mementos such as these have been preserved. Even visitors from outside Fukushima are impressed by the collection. I feel these items directly convey how these people's lives were suddenly disconnected and how cruel their situation was. Some people may say these objects are part of a negative legacy, but it won't stay negative if we learn lessons and start working to build a better world. I'll be happy if the objects help lead us to a positive future. Takahashi and his team want that too. So they'll continue to collect the object, hoping to tell stories of an unprecedented disaster and its painful aftermath. Jun Yotsumoto, NHK World, Fukushima. People around the world rushed to help Japan in the days after the quake and tsunami. Some sent aid, others messages of support. A number of survivors we met over the years wanted to say thanks and express how they're feeling on the fourth anniversary of the disaster. We've been able to reach where we are today thanks to the great support that many people gave us during the past four years. But we are still only part of the way down a difficult path toward recovery. I would be grateful for continued support from people of various organizations and regions. I always feel thankful to all the people who care about us. 
I'll continue my effort to live up to their expectations. It may be one step at a time, but we are definitely moving toward putting our lives back together. I've decided to remain in this community and keep operating my business as I was before the earthquake and tsunami. But today, four years after the disaster, I feel there is a limit to how much I can do. I know I have the support of my employees and my family, but we are experiencing really tough circumstances. Huge things happened, and we can never forget them. We don't want other people to forget them either. Remembering is not the same as continuing to look back. To be honest, I want to avert my mind from the memory of the disaster. But I'm convinced that passing along our stories will help protect people in days to come. I don't want anyone to go through the same things we have. I want to protect the children of the future. I feel very sad when I think about how devastated my hometown was. But everybody is working hard to recover. There's nothing we can do about such disasters. They are unavoidable. I have to keep at it. I can't give up. Many people say that the option of giving up does not exist in Fukushima. And I agree. The March 2011 disaster taught me how abruptly your loved ones can disappear from sight. But you should not regret or blame yourself over changes in the structure of your family. What you need to do is to think about what you should do next. I'm worried that the March 2011 disaster may have been forgotten already. I don't like to see the memory fading. I tell people the story of my disaster experience whenever I have an opportunity. So, well, you guys know me, of course, I'm John Doe, right here in Tokyo, Japan. For this video, I'm in my apartment, my new apartment, recently. Moved from uh, good old Kitasenju, or uh, Aoi, where my local area was, out here to uh, Nerima Ward. But that's not really the point of all this. Today, of course, is the day. The day when everything on this island and this nation changed forever. I'm of course referring to the massive 9.0 plus earthquake that rocked the entire nation of Japan and led to the start of one of the worst nuclear disasters in human history. It's of course talking about um, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster, which is still ongoing. Four years now since all that started, and I was here. I experienced it. It was a hell of a day. Man, that earthquake rocked the entire island. Everybody felt it in a serious way. It wasn't like 4.5 or 5.0 quake. Or like, you know, you're in Tokyo and you might feel a slight rumble. Nah. It wasn't like that at all. Like, I've talked about it before in previous um, anniversary videos, but I was teaching that day. Back when I was teaching adult students, mainly. And, and that thing hit and I thought, well, just another earthquake. This one's kind of strong. It started out that way. But quickly... <laughs> The entire building started shaking in a manner that we all knew this was something a bit more than the normal type of quake we had come to experience. So we all ducked under tables. Man, that building was rattling so hard. I mean, it was rippling. You could feel it. The ground is rippling. And, you know, there was a couple of seconds there where I thought I was going to die. I thought this was over. But luckily, that didn't happen. And here we are today, four years later. The cleanup and recovery effort from the tsunami that came is still proven to be kind of shit. 
you know, the government claimed to try them, but still the area is barely recovered. Still large areas that are useless. People still displaced from their homes, their communities. You know, and to even speak of Fukushima, that's just, that's fucking horrible. You know, it's still always no goes on, so it will probably be there forever. All the governments, although the governments lifted some of those restrictions, but most people here in Japan know you'd have to be a damn fool to return to those areas. The radiation is still out of control. The levels are still quite high. The plant itself is still a terrible mess. And over the years, we keep learning learning more and more about exactly why. Exactly why it's so horrible and why things can't get done up there. Despite it being kind of an unprecedented nuclear accident, disaster, there's a lot of other things going on. Most notably, massive corruption, you know, misuse of funds, a lot of greed, the Yakuza involvement, which makes it just worse than it should be. Man, when the Yaks are up there getting people there to work in the area, the way they treat those people, the way they take them for a ride, you know, all those people they offer. I've seen some of the advertisements here in Tokyo offering, you know, people to go up there and work, and they offer pretty good daily money. But most of that money is eaten up through your housing, which they take out of your payment for that, and your food, and even sometimes even safety equipment they're charging for. So you end up making a very little money, and sometimes no money, and sometimes end up in debt. It's really horrible. You know, and any time, you know, workers try to organize and fight, we've had accounts here come out of day laborers going missing, or even talking to labor unions. Although the, the organized labor that has got together have been fighting TEPCO as best they can. There's been several actions that some of the unionized workers have been able to take, but it's a hell of a situation to be in for a worker and really have an uphill battle. You know, you even have your know, dirty local corrupt politicians. Of course, you're going to have that. You have, you know, these contractors, a lot of them connected to Yakuza, some of them not. You know, foregoing any type of safety measures of letting people know exactly how much radiation they're exposed to so they can keep working on beyond the point they should be working there. Because, you know, as we all know, once you reach a, once you reach a certain level of exposure, you got to leave. you got to get out of there. You've been exposed to too much. Too fast. You gotta go. You gotta get some proper health checks. You gotta be away there for a while to make sure you're okay. Until you could, you know, come back, which, you know, who would want to? But there's a lot of people who do need to go back because they need the money. There's all that going on. Then there's, there's TEPCO itself, the company responsible for this power plant. And all their lies and half truths and stubbornness and, you know, aloofness and just. Being just a slimy, slimy corporation in general with the whole deal. And, you know, and then we have this all going on four years later. All the protest actions, especially here in Tokyo, the anti-nuclear movement in Japan, we got renewed vigor after all this. And I've been through a lot of these protests, and some of them are really large. Been there a few historic ones were massive. We've never seen, you know, protests like that in Japan Special and anti nuclear in a long time. <coughs> and people are still protesting and still fighting all this. But yet we have a government here that puts its head in the sand, ignores everything about Fukushima and everything about the extreme dangers of nuclear power. Doesn't want to admit the jack, you know? And just keeps saying, we're going to restart some of them. It looks like inevitably they probably will. I think I did a video a while back basically saying, yeah, they're probably going to start a few of them, restart a few of them. Which I know the reaction that people are going to have to that. They're going to fight it. And truly, really, I think, a bad move. All you're going to do is turn the people against you even more. 
you know, Abe's already, you know, his popularity is starting to wane and people are slowly starting to wake up to this jackass. You know, doing that, shooting himself in the foot, but I'm sure he's going to do it any damn way because, you know, be damned if he allows the growing um, renewable energy industry to flourish here in Japan, which it slowly has been, especially since uh, after Fukushima started. There's been a lot of solar power plants, massive solar power plant projects getting up and going. And a lot of geothermal has also become popular here in Japan. There's several local projects going up with that. You know, but be damned if he lets that go on. You know, um, the government before him had actually set up a system to uh, force power plant companies to buy a certain percentage of the energy produced by these renewable power, renewable energy sources, at a fixed mar fixed rate. So, but you know, Abe said, you know, fuck that, man. The visible hand of the free market will decide, and of course, it's going to decide nuclear power, and I'm going to make sure they make that the free market makes that decision. We all know what that means. You know, he's going to take care of his nuclear buddies. You know, he purged the entire uh, nuclear safety committee that the previous government had set up, which and that committee came out and said, we need to get rid of all this nuclear power. It's terrible, it's horrible, it's not good for us. He purged that committee of everyone who voted or had the opinion that we need to get rid of it and replaced them with people who said, yeah, we need nuclear power here in Japan. It's good for us. We have no alternative, you see. You see, we've been dealing with that these past four years. So, yeah, I thought I'd do a video just reflecting on the past four years. If you experienced all this in Japan when it happened four years ago, I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comment section of this video below. Regardless of where you see it, YouTube, Facebook, wherever, Twitter, wherever, I'd like to hear what you think. What your thoughts on the past four years have been. So until next time, this is me, John Doe, here in Tokyo, checking out. Well, officials uh, with Japan's land ministry gave a progress report on rebuilding in areas affected by the tsunami disaster. Minister Akihiro Ota pledged to ramp up the effort. The coming fiscal year is the last of five years of intensive reconstruction. We will make an effort to accelerate the work. Ota met with senior ministry officials. He said improving infrastructure is key to helping evacuees rebuild their livelihoods. Officials said they had secured nearly 90 percent of the land they need to build public housing for survivors, but only 20 percent of the projects have been completed. They stress the importance of rebuilding roads and other infrastructure, as well as housing and schools. People in Japan are observing the fourth anniversary of the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. The disaster devastated the country's northeast and triggered a meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. A magnitude 9.0 earthquake unleashed waves more than 10 meters high. The tsunami caused extensive damage along the Pacific coast. Nearly 18,500 people were killed or went missing. At least 3,200 others have died because of indirect effects such as illness or stress while living as evacuees. About 230,000 people were still living in temporary housing as of February. The government plans to build about 30,000 public housing units, but only 19 percent have been completed so far. Dismantling the crippled Fukushima Daiichi plant is one of Japan's biggest burdens. Workers with operator Tokyo Electric Power Company are struggling to deal with a buildup of radioactive water at the complex. TEPCO executives plan to clean up the tainted water by the end of March, but they say they won't be able to keep to the schedule. Authorities estimate it'll take up to 40 years to decommission the plant. There are concerns about possible delays. The most difficult task will be removing the melted nuclear fuel. The central and local governments plan to complete the decontamination work for mainly residential areas by March 2017. But the survivors fear public interest in the issue will decrease over time. Four years on, Japanese reflect on the past and look to the future as they mark the anniversary of the March 2011 disaster. 
Welcome to this special edition of Newsline. I'm Miki Yamamoto in Tokyo. March 11th is a day of prayers, commemoration, and contemplation in Japan. Residents of the Northeast have spent the past four years hearing the echoes of 3-11. The earthquake and tsunami destroyed communities and left thousands of people dead. It also triggered a nuclear accident that drove tens of thousands from their homes. People are now attending memorial ceremonies to pay tribute to the victims. And they will pause in about 15 minutes at 2.46 p.m. to mark the time the quake struck. We'll take you live to the National Memorial in Tokyo for the moment of silence. But first, let's go to one of the hardest hit towns in the Northeast. NHK World's Minori Takao has been covering life in Minami Sandiku since the disaster. And she's there again today. Minori, how are people marking this anniversary? Well, Miki, from early in the morning, we've seen many visitors come from all across the country to pay their respects to victims of the disaster. We've seen monks come in from early in the morning as well to pray. I'm standing in front of what used to be Minami Sandiku's Disaster Prevention Center. Uh, what you're seeing are the bare bones of what was left on March 11th of 2011. Town officials were here calling out to residents to evacuate using loudspeakers till the very last minute. 60 meter high tsunami swamped the entire structure and 43 people died here. People from around town have also come in to bring flowers to the altar, as you can see at this moment in time. There are also many town residents who have gone to the gymnasium for the memorial ceremony that began just a few minutes ago. Um, you've been watching the town's reconstruction and meeting survivors who have been trying to move forward. What kind of changes have you seen there? Well, you know, I have been seeing Minami Sandiku from the time this town was littered with debris to a place that's finally beginning to have roads and reconstruct. Here are some of the things that I noticed this time around. The remains of the seawall still sit by the bay. Crews have been building a higher one, 16 meters inland. You can still see evidence of the tsunami's destructive power if you stand on the hills overlooking Minami Sandiku. Before the disaster, the municipal office, hospital, shopping center, factories, even residences stood in the center of town. Under the new plan, shops and industrial facilities will be constructed here again. But everything else is being moved to higher ground. New homes are finally springing up. This public housing complex opened last August. Hey, Hello. 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 Yoshito Kajiwara and his wife moved in after spending three years in temporary housing. Their monthly rent is subsidized. There aren't many of these units available, so people have to enter a lottery to get in. I'm happy to finally live in a nicer place. Maintaining a stable job is crucial for residents to continue living in Minami Sandiku. But that hasn't been easy. Even people working in the town's main industry, fishing, are having a hard time. 34 year old Naoya Takahashi and his family have been in the trade for generations. After the disaster, he had to rebuild facilities, buy a new boat, and new equipment. Other fishermen shouldered similar costs. Takahashi says almost all of his friends have part-time jobs. He's worried people might quit the fishery and leave Minami Sandiku. Many fishermen are working at construction sites to make a living. But they strongly wish they could spend all their time at sea. So Takahashi and the younger fishermen started what they call blue tourism, fishing tours that include a chance to taste the catch. Oh. 
By working with the town's tourism office, they've received more than 1,000 participants from around Japan, even some from abroad. This time, they welcomed a group from Taiwan. Takahashi showed them how seaweed is processed. He says face-to-face -face communication and first-hand experience is the best way to promote the area's marine products. Takahashi says he's come to realize the things he'd taken for granted are precious. The disaster has brought all kinds of people to this area, and their views have opened my eyes to the reality that this place is truly beautiful. Well, people are trying to rebuild their lives despite the sorrow of having lost their loved ones. And still, for some others, it's been harder to move forward. Now, all of this is leading to a discussion about what to do with structures that the tsunami left behind, including this disaster prevention center. Uh, structures such as these are being torn down as reconstruction progresses. Um, you know, but these things, people want to preserve some of what's standing. Others want these to be removed. People in Minami Sandiku are very divided over this building. The divisions came to the surface in 2013, when town officials announced plans to tear the building down. One reason is financial. Minami Sandiku's mayor said it would be difficult to secure funds to preserve it. But in January, professional officials put things on hold. Governor Murai proposed that a decision be postponed until 2031, 20 years after the disaster. In the meantime, he said the prefecture would manage the structure. The town has not yet responded to the prefecture's proposal, but some residents are voicing opposition. 68-year-old Miyoko Chiba is calling for it to be torn down. Her son-in-law, who worked for the local government, lost his life in the disaster prevention center. Chiba can't bring herself to look at the building because of the horrific memories that come back. The place reminds us of great pain, so when we heard the news of the demolition plans, we were so relieved it brought tears to our eyes. Chiba says any move to postpone the demolition would simply prolong her suffering. I can't stand that. There are plenty of people who can't move forward easily. The governor's proposal has caused deep reflection in the town. Some people who lost loved ones are speaking out. Wataru Oikawa's father was another public servant who died in the building. It was a long time before Oikawa could even drive past it. But recently, he realized his feelings had calmed and was able to look at it objectively. He thinks people's feelings will change as the town recovers and begins to look different. The building is a delicate subject, and it's difficult for local people to talk about it. Honestly, I think the passage of time is a big factor. Oikawa has submitted a request to the town council. He asked it to accept the moratorium proposal and postpone the decision until the 20th anniversary of the tsunami. Oikawa is still ambivalent about what should be done. Now, he says, what's important is for town residents to discuss the matter. I think the key question is not what to do with the building, but what to leave for the future. We should take our time and take a broad view, and each of us should talk more openly about what should be done.
people in the disaster hit region also offered their prayers to those who died and remembered how life has changed since that day four years ago. Mm -hmm. 